East Lampeter Township, Pennsylvania. Nestled in the Amish enclave of Lancaster County, it's a quiet old-fashioned town. On the morning of December 20th, 1991, Hazel Show left home while her 16-year-old daughter Lori was still getting ready for school. She had an appointment to meet Lori's guidance counselor. When the counselor didn't show up for the meeting, Hazel returned home. As she approached her apartment, a neighbor appeared and said she had heard loud noises coming from Hazel's unit. I didn't think a lot about it because most anything is a commotion when you have a teenager in the house. And I came up the stairs, uh, opened the door, came in and called Lori. There was no answer, but the lights were on. Hazel checked her daughter's bathroom and then her bedroom. And then I looked over and uh, she was on the floor uh, and there was lots of blood around her. So she had a rope around her neck. So I ran to the kitchen, got a knife and went in and slipped my fingers under the rope and cut it and she moaned. Um, at that time, I saw that um, her throat was cut. Uh, so I basically uh, cradled her in my arms, trying to hold her together. Hazel would later tell police that even though Lori's neck wounds were severe, her daughter managed to name her killer. She said that Michelle did it, Michelle, Michelle, and then she kept saying, love you, until she was just mouthing, love you. Hazel knew the name. Michelle was 19-year-old Lisa Michelle Lambert, who had been stalking her daughter for months and had threatened to kill her. Police had a warrant out for Lambert's arrest, but had claimed they had been unable to locate her. Lambert was upset with Lori for having briefly dated her boyfriend, Lawrence Yunkin. Lambert, a bleached blonde who changed her brown eyes to blue with colored contacts, went exclusively by her middle name, Michelle. At age 15, she had dropped out of high school and moved out of her parents' house. They had accused her of stealing money from them. She had moved in with her boyfriend, and the young couple were now living in a trailer in the woods. Six months before the murder in June 1991, when Lambert found out that Laurie Show was having a fling with her boyfriend, she began making harassing phone calls to Laurie's house and announced that she was pregnant with Lawrence's baby. She accused Laurie of ruining her life. A couple of times I called, there were um, problems. I was pregnant. I was pregnant and I just wanted to basically leave everything alone. I wanted to stop having problems. I had no idea what I was going to do. And if you answered the phone, she would just scream obscenities at you, uh, scream at you how Lori ruined her life, um, that Lori had sex with Lawrence, what a bad person Laurie was. And if you didn't answer the phone, it would just keep ringing and ringing. Hazel Show finally had to have her phone number changed and unlisted. After only a week, Laurie broke off the relationship with Lawrence and he returned to his old girlfriend. Laurie told her mother that Lawrence had raped her, but she decided not to file a police report against him, fearing it would make Lambert even angrier. When Lambert could no longer harass Laurie's show by phone, she began stalking her at the dress shop in a local strip mall where Laurie worked as a sales clerk. Laurie would get really nervous, upset, and want to go a different way. She just didn't want Michelle to see her. She was terrified of her. One day in late November 1991, as Laurie's show was chatting with friends outside the mall, Lambert and her boyfriend drove by. Lambert got out of the car, walked up to Laurie, slapped her and banged her head against the cab of a truck. I said, 
um, something to the effect if something happens to my baby or if my baby dies, um, I could just kill you or I'm going to kill you. That's what I said. Laurie Show and her mother responded by filing an assault complaint against Lambert. The following month, Hazel Show held her dying daughter in her arms, convinced that Lambert's jealous rage had robbed her of her only child. Paramedics arrived at the show apartment, but it was no use. 16-year-old Laurie was pronounced dead before her body was removed from her bedroom. Detectives immediately began interviewing friends of both the victim, Laurie Show, and their chief suspect, Lisa Michelle Lambert. One line that I always will remember is when they, one afternoon we were talking, she said one way or another she will get Laurie Show out of the picture. Detective John Bowman was told that on numerous occasions, Lambert had tried to recruit friends to help her injure Laurie. There was one... Uh, young lady that I talked to in particular uh, that I remember the interview very well um, she basically described the plot where Lisa Lambert was going to uh, take Lori Shell, kidnap her uh, take her into the city and then use a knife and slit her throat on the night of the murder police found Lambert and her boyfriend at the garden spot bowling alley in nearby Strasburg Pennsylvania with them was a friend, 17-year-old Tabitha Buck, who had a gash across her right cheek. When officers demanded to know how she'd been hurt, Lambert did the talking. Lambert voluntarily blurted out, Oh, yeah, well, we got into a fight earlier this morning with some Hispanic girls. And Tabby never said nothing. Police brought all three in for questioning. At the station, they separated the teenagers and interrogated each of them about the Laurie Show murder. Lawrence Yunkin admitted that at around 6.50 that morning, he had dropped off Lambert and Buck near Laurie Show's apartment complex. He said he thought they were going to beat up Laurie. He claimed he went to a nearby McDonald's for breakfast and returned 15 minutes later. Yunkin told police that at first, he was unable to find the two young women near the woods where they had planned to meet, but that after driving around for a few minutes, he spotted them. He said he saw blood on Lambert's hand and said the girls smelled funny, so he drove them to his trailer to shower and then took Tabitha to school. Lawrence confessed to police that he and Lambert then washed the clothing that Lambert and Tabitha had worn that morning, placed it in a pink trash bag, and threw it in a dumpster behind a local Kmart. They also tossed the murder weapon and a pair of bloody tennis shoes into the nearby Susquehanna River. While they were disposing of the evidence, Lawrence said Lambert told him that she and Tabitha had accidentally stabbed Laurie Show in the back and then slit her throat to put her out of pain. Lawrence also reported to police that the evening before the murder, he had taken Lambert to a local Kmart where she had purchased items that were taken to the show apartment. A rope, ski hats, and gloves. By now, officers had found the pink trash bag. Filled with blood-stained evidence, it confirmed Lawrence's statement. In another interrogation room, Lisa Michelle Lambert had a different story. While she admitted to being in the show apartment, she claimed that Tabitha Buck was the one who had attacked Laurie. But there was a problem. Lambert had already reported to police what clothes she had been wearing that morning, and her answer didn't match what police had just found in the dumpster. And that's when she started to add, oh yeah, I lied to you, I didn't have this kind of clothing on, instead I had sweatpants, blah, blah, blah. That's when she changed, because she knew, obviously, somebody more than likely Yunkin had given up the fact where these clothing could be found. Lambert now also confessed that it was her idea to visit Laurie Show, but she claimed she simply wanted to talk to Laurie and tell her that she had finally decided to leave her alone. 
According to Lambert, Tabitha Buck knocked on Laurie's front door, and when Laurie answered, Tabitha forced her way inside. Lambert soon followed. She said Tabitha and Laurie were fighting in the hallway and claimed that the fight eventually led to Laurie's bedroom, where Laurie tried to grab the telephone, but Tabitha threw it down. She said Tabitha then began to stab Laurie. Her face was um, red and like she was having a hard time breathing. And I had uh, seen Tabitha stab her in the back one time. Lambert said Laurie's body was jerking and she couldn't look at her anymore, so she turned away and ran out of the door. When one of the detectives wanted to know who had cut Laurie Show's throat, Lambert responded with surprise. I said, oh my God, I, I just, um, I was totally shocked. I, that was when I believed him that she was dead because he was so serious and he was so, um, I don't know, he just totally, I was stunned. Lambert said she had wanted to help Laurie but was afraid of Tabitha who still had the knife. On the advice of her attorney, Tabitha Buck did not give police a statement. Both she and Lambert were charged with first-degree murder. Prosecutors, unable to place Lambert's boyfriend Lawrence Yunkett at the crime scene, cut a deal with him in which he agreed to testify against both women. As the Laurie Show murder case unfolded, it would become far more than a small-town teenage love triangle turned violent. A federal judge would proclaim that it was the worst example of prosecutorial misconduct in the English-speaking world. And the FBI would end up investigating charges that police lied under oath and prosecutors engaged in a cover-up. At the center of this legal firestorm, Lisa Michelle Lambert. Was she a killer? were the victim of false testimony. On March 19, 1992, while awaiting trial for murder in a Pennsylvania prison, Lisa Michelle Lambert was transferred to a nearby hospital where she gave birth to a baby girl, whom she named Kirsten. The baby was placed in the custody of Lambert's parents. The biological father, Lawrence Yunkin, was also in prison and was no longer Lambert's boyfriend. He was now the government's key witness against her. Four months later in July, fearing that perhaps any local jury would convict her, Lambert gave up her right to a trial by jury. Instead, Judge Lawrence Stengel would now decide her fate. Prosecutors argued that Lambert had planned and committed the murder of Laurie Show and that she deserved to die for it. Michelle Lambert uh, admitted that uh, the statements of the witnesses regarding the um, harassment, the threats to kill, were accurate and disputed only whether she, Lambert, ever stated that she wanted to slit Laurie Show's throat. Investigators had found a knife in the river where Lambert's boyfriend, Lawrence Yunkin, had said they dumped evidence. It matched the knives in their trailer home. Neighbors of Laurie Show also testified that on the morning of the murder, they had seen what appeared to be two women of equal height leaving the apartment complex. This, the prosecutor argued, would exclude Yunkin, who was much taller than Lambert and Buck, who were roughly the same height. A witness also confirmed seeing Lawrence at a McDonald's that morning. Prosecutors also leaned hard on the testimony of the murder victim's mother, Hazel Show, who told the judge that she heard her dying daughter say, quote, Michelle did it, referring to Lisa Michelle, Michelle Lambert. It seemed, quite honestly, like a pretty cut and dried murder case. We've got the murder, we've got the suspects, and they seemed like the guilty parties. In her defense, Lambert took the stand and claimed that Tabitha Buck and her former boyfriend Lawrence were the real killers. She insisted that she had been covering for Lawrence when she told police that he was not in the apartment on the morning of the murder. Lambert told the judge that she had only planned to tie Laurie up and cut her hair, but that Tabitha had gone wild, stabbing her with the knife. Tabitha had gone crazy. She had hurt Laurie, and I tried to get her off of Laurie. I tried to get Laurie out of there, and I couldn't do it. I ran outside, and I ran into Lawrence, and Lawrence took me down the stairs and pushed me down and gave me an order to stay there. 
and that's where I stayed. He ran back up the stairs, um, the door slammed, I heard more noises, and that was, that was all I knew. Prosecutor Jack Kanef argued that Lambert's story had conveniently evolved. Initially, she said that uh, none of them were there uh, and that none of the three had anything to do with the killing. It sh then shifted to Lawrence Yunkin was totally innocent of the crime. And by the time she got to trial, she was able to say that she actually saw Lawrence Yunkin go into the apartment. So her story has uh, changed over time. Lambert said she initially covered up for her boyfriend because she thought Laurie's death was an accident. She said she changed her mind about lying for him after they exchanged one of many letters in prison. In a strangely worded document that came to be known as the 29 Questions, Youngkin responded to a series of questions that Lambert posed to him. She claims Lawrence's answers shocked her. He basically didn't care. He was like a monster. And one of the questions I asked him, um, I know you're sorry and you didn't mean to kill her and everything because at that point I believe that he really hadn't meant to do it and he went wrong. Another question reads, will you always stick with me as long as I still don't tell that you held Laurie down for Tabby? Lawrence's answer, which doesn't quite match the question, is, we'll always love you. Are you sure that if I take the blame for you that I'll get less time, Lambert writes. Absolutely sure. His answer? Yes. Lawrence Yunkin tried to claim that his handwriting had been forged on the document, but a prosecution expert testified that the document had not been altered. The questions were written by the uh, Lambert, and Yunkin wrote the answers. The most controversial issue, however, was whether the dying teenager could have named her killer. Lambert's defense argued that it would have been impossible for Laurie to speak. Her neck had been slashed from ear to ear, and her wound was more than an inch deep. But even the defense experts were unable to rule out the possibility that she may have spoken. In the end, Judge Lawrence Stengel said he believed Laurie Show said Michelle did it. We could not prove exactly what her role was in the crime, but I think we clearly proved that she participated and that she shared the intent to kill. The judge returned a verdict of guilty of first-degree murder and criminal conspiracy. Lambert was sentenced to life in prison. The judge said he spared Lambert's life because of her youth, her lack of a criminal record, and because he thought she could make a contribution, albeit in prison, to her baby daughter and family. Two months later, in September 1992, Tabitha Buck went before a jury in nearby Northampton County. Her attorney argued that Tabitha had no motive to kill Laurie and that the murder was the work of Lambert and Lawrence Yunkin. The jury disagreed, however, and sentenced her to life in prison without parole. Yunkin's deal with the county had been called off after prosecutors accused him of lying in his testimony about the so-called 29 questions. In October, he agreed to plead no contest to third-degree murder and was sentenced to 10 to 20 years in state prison. By this time, Lambert was already in state prison and by her own account, living in fear. Soon after she began serving her life sentence, Lisa Michelle Lambert accused a guard of raping her and was transferred to a prison in New Jersey. Over the next four years, she appealed her case until she finally won the attention of a federal judge in Philadelphia. The result for Lambert was a stunning reversal of fortune. After her conviction in 1992 for first-degree murder, Lisa Michelle Lambert appealed her case, but was turned down every time. Then, in 1996, she mailed a handwritten note to a federal judge in Philadelphia and set in motion a chain of events that would stun the legal world and horrify those who were convinced of her guilt. I wrote that police and prosecutors had framed me. I wrote about the 29 questions that Lawrence Youngkin had admitted in his own handwriting that he and Tabitha Buck had killed Lori Show and that I was innocent. In legal terms, Lambert's letter was a petition under a clause in the U.S. Constitution 
called habeas corpus. It lets a federal judge decide if someone is being unjustly held in prison. Normally what happens if a federal judge finds that there were substantial errors in a state criminal proceeding of a federal constitutional nature, the federal judge will order the state either release the prisoner or to retry the prisoner. The judge to whom Lambert wrote, Stuart Dalzell, passed her letter along to a big law firm in Philadelphia, where it caught the eye of 34-year-old attorney Christina Rainville. She took the case. Rainville was struck by the plea bargain that Lambert's boyfriend, Lawrence Yunkin, had worked out with Lancaster County prosecutors. She couldn't understand why investigators had discounted the possibility that Yunkin had played a greater role in the murder than he claimed. In fact, the day before the murder, Yunkin told his best friend at work that he was never going to be back at work because he was going to be in jail for murder and that he was planning uh, to kill a girl over the weekend. And I think the evidence shows in retrospect that Yunkin and Buck premeditated this murder and that Lisa was set up to be there. To her new lawyers, Lambert seemed like an abused woman who had obeyed an abusive boyfriend, even if that meant going to prison. She both covers for Yunkin because he tells her she has to. He, he's saying, you're a girl, you'll get off easily. Uh, and she's doing what she's told, which is her conditioned reflex, especially at times of crisis. Her attorneys concluded that not only was Lambert's 1992 trial a miscarriage of justice, but she was, in fact, innocent of the crime for which she'd been convicted. Over the fierce objections of Lancaster County prosecutors, Judge Dalzell agreed to a hearing and gave Lambert's aggressive new lawyers access to nearly everything in the government's files on the case. The emerging evidence painted a troubling picture. We've alleged over 200 errors that occurred in her trial, including 60 items of favorable evidence that the prosecution had that they didn't turn over to the defense as they are required to do so by law. Among the items allegedly suppressed were pieces of evidence found at the crime scene, a police videotape, and statements from witnesses that seemed to contradict the county's version of events. Lambert now made the stunning claim that three Lancaster County police officers had raped her six months before the murder. She said prosecutors had focused on her to protect these men. With their case gaining new attention, Lambert's defenders also set to work reinventing their client. The blonde-haired beauty who went by her middle name, Michelle, and wore blue contact lenses, now called herself Lisa Lambert and had brown hair and dark eyes. Rainville probably thought that she could get a lot further and get a sweeter image of, of Lisa to the public if she changed her, uh, her image. When the hearing began in March 1997, Lambert's attorneys claimed that the Lancaster County case was an elaborate frame-up and that Tabitha Buck and Lawrence Yunkin were the true murderers. They argued that the only thing their client was guilty of was trying to protect her boyfriend. If she doesn't cover up for him, he's going to get off anyway, because he always gets away with things. And that's going to be an enormous risk to her child, that if she defies him, when the child is born, he will inflict some harm on the child. Over the next 12 days, the defense brought in a parade of witnesses who took apart Lambert's 1992 trial, citing hospital records, an expert on physical and sexual abuse of women testified that Lambert's relationship with Yunkin was abusive. A speech expert attacked the notion that the dying Laurie Show could have spoken, saying her neck wounds were far too severe for her to have formed any words. But even more damning to the government's case were the revelations about misconduct by investigators and prosecutors. Lambert's defense team had discovered crime scene evidence that Lancaster County prosecutors had ignored or failed to disclose to Lambert's trial lawyer. 1992, the police testified at Lisa's trial. They never found a pink trash bag. They never found any trash bags. And they never found any sneakers. In 1997, we obtained 
videotape of the police finding a pink trash bag on the river bank, and that information was suppressed. Prosecutors disputed every one of the defense claims and insisted they had neither destroyed nor tampered with any evidence. When you look at the total picture, is this a case of a frame-up uh, of the police deliberately engaging in misconduct? Or is it a case, as the, the, the Commonwealth now says, well, there may have been some small mistakes, but they didn't affect the ultimate outcome in any way? Judge Dalzell grew increasingly impatient with the prosecutors. On the stand, the local officials repeatedly contradicted themselves and the evidence. The judge began to berate them openly. The judge was just against us from the beginning. It was evident that he hated the police. He just hated Lancaster County. He didn't want, you know, anything to do with us. I don't think you should be able to go into a courtroom and the first day feel that he's going to grant her an appeal. And from the second day feel that, that he wants to find a way to let her go. In Lancaster County, the public followed the trial in disbelief. I've covered the hearing in Philadelphia, so I'd have to call in here every day with my, um, you know, view on what was happening today. And everyone would go, well, you think she's going to get off, do you think? <laughs> I, after hearing a couple of days of that federal hearing, I said, I think she's going to want to get out of here. Something's going to happen here. One of the people most troubled by the federal hearing was the mother of the murder victim, Hazel Show. And yet, she was the one who, in the end, revealed information that helped Lambert's cause. In a private meeting with the Lancaster District Attorney, she now recalled that she had seen Lawrence Yunkin near her apartment on the morning of the murder. At the time, she said a police officer had told her not to worry about it. It now emerged that, in fact, both Hazel and a neighbor had seen him there. While police had known about this, they had failed to follow up on the lead. They knew Lawrence was involved. They knew he was there. And from day one, they just withheld that from the defense. We forced the state to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt before we imprison somebody. Uh, and we say, play by fair rules. Uh, don't manufacture evidence. Don't hide evidence. Turn over exculpatory evidence. Um, do it fairly. The prosecutor's failure to disclose this information back in 1992 was potentially illegal. After all, the key part of their case was that Lawrence Yunkin could not be placed at the crime scene while Lisa Lambert could be. This new information did not prove that Lawrence was in the apartment, but it would no doubt have been useful in Lambert's 1992 defense. The Lancaster County DA had no choice but to have Hazel Show tell the judge. In a meeting in his chambers, she told her story, and immediately, chaos ensued. So I get the words out that I actually saw Lawrence's face that morning, and the judge immediately says that she deserves relief. And all this is going on, and I'm not talking anymore. I'm not telling him anything because he doesn't want to hear anymore. And then they start talking about releasing her, and, and I'm, I'm just like, what's going on? Judge Dalzell had heard enough. By his count, six state witnesses had perjured themselves before him. He declared that he was unaware of a case in the English-speaking world with as much misconduct by police and prosecutors. He demanded that Lambert be released immediately. On the final day of the hearing, Judge Dalzell declared Lambert innocent of all charges. He accused Lancaster County of making a pact with the devil and argued that the prosecutor's misconduct violated Lambert's constitutional right to due process. In an unusual twist, he forbade the state of Pennsylvania from ever retrying her. He then ordered the U.S. Attorney's Office in Philadelphia and the FBI to investigate county police and prosecutors. The decision sent shockwaves through the judicial system. 
A number of states began lining up with Pennsylvania to contest the right of a federal judge to forbid the state from retrying Lambert. Back in Lancaster County, Laurie Show's parents began a petition drive calling for the impeachment of Judge Dalzell. Lisa Michelle Lambert, meanwhile, was a free woman, but not for long. 1997, Lisa Michelle Lambert walked out of Judge Stuart Dalzell's Philadelphia courtroom a free woman. The federal judge had declared her innocent and accused police, prosecutors, and her ex-boyfriend, Lawrence Yunkin, of conspiring against her. The decision provoked angry criticism in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, where locals gathered 37,000 signatures, calling for the judge to be impeached. Six states joined Pennsylvania in filing a brief to the Third Circuit Court of Appeals. They argued that Lambert's federal hearing violated states' rights because Lambert had not yet presented her new allegations in state court first. The court agreed, ruling that Lambert should never have been in federal court in the first place. They didn't say one thing or another as to whether Judge Dalzell was right or wrong. They just said that the state court decide those issues first. So after 10 months of freedom, Lambert was returned to her New Jersey prison cell. The first time that I was free and I walked out into the sunshine, I thought, I'll never be back in prison. I'll never have to face this nightmare. And here I am again, going through the same thing. Now Lambert would have to argue her case again in Lancaster County Court. The Pennsylvania Attorney General's office, now in charge of the case, prepared to argue that for Lambert's story to be believed, nearly 100 people would have had to be involved in the conspiracy. And that includes people that have no knowledge of one another, don't, don't know one another at all, have no reason, or if they do know one another, have no reason to be uh, involved in this huge conspiracy together. Not only did the frame-up seem unlikely, according to Fawcett, the motive for the frame-up, an alleged gang rape, was equally unbelievable. Since her imprisonment, Lambert had alleged rape on numerous other occasions. The allegations included um, police officers, uh, included family members, included um, uh, prison guards, included uh, other men with whom she had had contact with, um, friends or friends of friends. And when we added all, all that up, we came to a figure of at least 11. In April 1998, Lambert was again in front of Judge Lawrence Stengel, the same judge who had returned a guilty verdict against her back in 1992. Now, she had to prove that she had been unjustly convicted in that trial. In her opening argument, Lambert's defense attorney Christina Rainville again argued that East Lampeter police officers had raped Lisa Lambert six months prior to the murder of Laurie Show and had then conspired with prosecutors to frame her. This time, however, the defense added another stunning allegation. Lambert's attorney said investigators took Laurie Show's body out of the morgue and moved it back to the apartment to stage crime scene photographs. They claimed these photos, which do not match the official crime scene sketches, were staged to implicate Lambert. Our belief that to redo the crime scene photographs Laurie Show's body had to be returned to the crime scene. The evidence shows that they did whatever was necessary to recreate the crime scene photographs in a way that would discredit Lisa. Officers deny the charge and insist that the allegations by Lambert's defense were misleading. The most implausible allegation for Fawcett was Lambert's claim to have been sexually assaulted by county police officers. In fact, one of the officers whom Lambert accused of raping her, John Bowman, was away on his honeymoon, out of state, at the time she alleges that he broke into her house and attacked her. The officer submitted a marriage certificate and hotel receipts as proof. You know, that allegation in of itself really shot uh, Miss Lambert's credibility. This rape just didn't happen. Lambert's charges also angered Tabitha Buck. By this time, Tabitha had already spent six years in prison. She now agreed to tell her side of the story for the first time. On the stand, Buck admitted that by holding Laurie Show down during the struggle, she had been an accomplice to her death. 
but claimed that it was Lambert who actually committed the murder. Tabitha Buck described what occurred at the conclusion of this incident where Laurie Show was already seriously injured. She was on the floor bleeding badly and um, Lambert kneeled next to her and he sawed her neck like a loaf of bread. Tabitha also testified that Lawrence Yunkin was never in the apartment and accused Lambert of lying to get out of prison. Lambert insists that Tabitha is the one lying. She nailed her own coffin shut and she is just trying to drag me down. I think she's bitter. I think she's miserable. She knows she's never ever going to get out of prison. Throughout the eight weeks of court proceedings, prosecutors argued that it was Lambert who had the motive to kill, who had committed the previous assaults, and who had purchased the rope, ski hats, and gloves that were taken to the apartment the morning of the murder. Lambert's conduct after the murder occurred indicated that it was her who planned this thing, who carried it out, and so forth. She was the one who got rid of evidence. She admitted to getting rid of evidence. She told police about that. In the end, Fawcett said that Lambert's defense had tried just about everything to distract attention from the fact that she was guilty of murder. And the allegations were so outrageous. I mean, there's no other way to say it than outrageous. But the bottom line, of course, is none of them have been proven to be true. Judge Stengel agreed that Lambert's allegations were implausible. He denied her petition and ordered that she remain in prison. In a 300-page opinion, Judge Lawrence Stengel said mistakes might have been made by Lancaster police and prosecutors, but they did not amount to a conspiracy, and they certainly didn't exonerate Lambert from the murder of Laurie Show. Still, Lambert's case was far from over. In August 1998, the same Pennsylvania judge who six years earlier had found Lisa Michelle Lambert guilty of first-degree murder declared once again that she was a killer. The judge, Lawrence Stengel, rejected Lambert's claims that she had been raped by police officers and then framed by prosecutors. But his decision did not put an end to either the mystery of the Laurie Show murder or the legal battle. Even though a federal judge had ruled ten months earlier that Lambert was innocent and the victim of a deeply flawed trial, the state court now denied her petition for release and said she would have to remain in prison. I was proven innocent in a federal court of law. I was home for 10 months and I was a responsible member of society and I don't understand why I'm in here. Lambert's attorneys took her case to a federal appeals court but lost. In early 2005, they petitioned the U.S. Supreme Court to reinstate federal judge Stuart Dalzell's ruling that Lambert is innocent. For as long as, as Lisa remains in prison, if Lisa is not free, I don't think there's freedom for any of us. I think that all of us should live in fear because we have a justice system that is not working. What exactly happened inside Laurie Show's apartment on December 20th, 1991 is still unclear. Arguably Lambert, her ex-boyfriend Lawrence Yunkin and their friend Tabitha Buck all had a hand in it. And yet those who investigated the show murder and prosecuted Lisa Lambert for it insist that, at the end of the day, the evidence still points to her as the one most responsible for the crime. They point out that Lambert did confess to being in the show apartment on the morning of the murder. She also admitted to purchasing the rope and gloves that were used in the crime. Worst of all, they say, Lambert admitted that Laurie Show was seriously injured and did nothing to seek help. Instead, she destroyed evidence and, along with Tabitha Buck and Lawrence Yunkin, developed a cover story. But for Lisa Michelle Lambert, Laurie Show would not have died the way she did, December 20th, 1991. No doubt about it. She was convicted fair and square, and she should remain in prison for the rest of her life. But Lambert's attorneys say the evidence does not prove beyond a reasonable doubt that she is guilty of first-degree murder. They argue that the judicial system has given in to the whims of public opinion. America is not supposed to be a place that takes innocent people from their homes, rapes them, 
and imprisons them for the rest of their lives. It's not supposed to happen. I do not believe in any way that I'm responsible for the death of Lorisha. The police in East Lampeter Township and the Lancaster Police and the prosecutor's office blamed me for a murder I did not commit. Laurie Show's parents remain convinced that Lambert killed their daughter. She was there. And I still feel that she did it because Laurie told her mother Michelle did it. And I believe that 100%. No doubt in my mind. Michelle's the one who cut Laurie's throat. Michelle deserves to have a miserable, long life in prison. Not special treatment. There's nothing special about her. She's just evil. With so many conflicting elements, the case remains a mystery. The question is, who did it? Um, you know, hopefully we never say just because there's been a clearly committed murder, uh, you know, that somebody's got to pay. We want to make sure it's the right person uh, who pays with, with her life or life in, imprisonment. In 1998, federal authorities wrapped up their investigation into alleged misconduct in the Lambert case and announced that there was insufficient evidence to bring charges against officials in Lancaster County. In 2004, Lambert's ex-boyfriend, Lawrence Youngkin, was released from prison. As for Lisa Lambert, in May 2005, her journey through the legal system came to an end when the U.S. Supreme Court refused to hear her case. If nothing else changes, she will spend the rest of her life behind bars. Victim Laurie Show's mother says, now that Lambert's appeals are over, quote, we can move forward and remember Laurie for the good person she was.